Opening with another influence on noir, we have the Universal Horror Film. Everyone knows the monsters, even if you haven't seen the movies. The Wolfman, Frankenstein's monster, the mummy, the creature from the Black Lagoon, the Invisible Man, and Dracula, who we will be discussing today. These films gave us the atmosphere and foreboding seen in noir, the much darker side of things. They were exotic and out of time. The look of them owes a lot to the cinematography of Karl Freund, who fled from Germany with all the other German greats. So let's do it. To all you out of work soda jerks without a penny to pinch, to the detectives with all the answers, to the dastardly dames who play men like baby dolls, and the trusted ones too pure for this world, and all you double-crossing, backstabbing, ruthless, baby-faced amateurs, this one's for you. So suit up, turn out the lights, put the match to your smokes, and sit back for the darker side of things. Sin a shadow moonlights, noir vimper. So the film opens, and out comes Renfield. He's just arrived in Transylvania, and he has a business meeting with a certain count. He's greeted by the townsfolk with a warning. Do not go up to that castle. That's where Dracula lives, dude. Don't go there. So his coach arrives and takes him to the castle, but he doesn't really get that good of a look at the driver. And at one point when he pokes his head out of the window, he sees a bat driving the coach. Our first introduction to Dracula is a great tracking shot by Freund. Through smoke and shadow, it shows us Bela Lugosi for the first time, draped in all black, menacing, seemingly sucking us in with his trance. What a sexual Hungarian man. Grotesque, misshapen trees, fog and darkness, and Lugosi's illuminated eyes create the perfect atmosphere to propel us towards the castle. Renfield's introduction to Dracula is a great scene as well. The mood is set perfectly. Everything draped in spiderweb, shadow, bats, rats, armadillos. It's awesome. And when Dracula speaks, it's unforgettable. I am Dracula. I bid you welcome. Listen to them. Children of the night. What music they make. So eerie. They get to talking about different things, food and drink. He offers Dracula some wine. Dracula says, I never drink wine. He eventually hypnotizes and confuses Renfield. And here come Dracula's brides. One cool thing about one of the actresses is that her real name was Mildred Pierce, which may be a movie coming up later. So they start approaching him. They're going to feed on him, and Dracula busts in the room and says, Nuh-uh, ladies, he's all mine. He ends up biting Renfield, and off we go to the ship. Later on the ship, we see Renfield as a raving lunatic, a slave to Dracula's powers. The authorities find the captain dead and a few of the other crew members, and they blame it on Renfield. He's later sent to the hospital, which is adjacent to Carfax Abbey, where Dracula's staying. Later that night, we see cars and buses driving around London. This tells us that we're in modern times. Later that night at the opera, Dracula is introduced to Dr. Seward, Jonathan, Mina, and Lucy. He's invited into their booth, and Lucy takes an immediate attraction to him. There's also some dialogue that Dracula speaks that really shows the tortured soul of a vampire. Like when he's in the opera seats with Mina and the rest of them, and he says, To die, to really be dead, that must be glorious. And again he speaks, There are far worse things awaiting man than death. Also the shots of Dracula with his hands looking all gangly and misshapen, the way he changes them into like a sort of a claw, or straight out of German expressionism. 
Later that night, Dracula sinks his teeth into her and makes her his victim. Later at the hospital, we see Renfield again. He's now obsessed with eating spiders and flies. It seems Dracula promised him a lot more than that, including human blood. But now that Dracula's got what he wants, Renfield, you're shit out of luck. Then we're introduced to Van Helsing. Van Helsing is always a character that you love. Because he knows everything about vampires. He doesn't care who doesn't believe him. He knows the truth. And he'll be the one to stake the bastard. So he starts talking about vampires, brings up a lot of the lore, finds out that Renfield has had contact with this Dracula by showing him the wolf's bane and him, you know, kind of reacting to it and stepping away from it, giving him a clue that Dracula is in town. Then Dracula, feeling pretty confident, goes into Mina's room and bites her. She starts acting a little funny, and they're wondering what really happened to her. Then Helsing knows. So he stays there the next night, and when Dracula approaches, he does a few tests, like showing him his reflection in the mirror and just looking at his different movements and things like that. Once Dracula sees that he doesn't have a reflection, he slaps the mirror out of Van Helsing's hands and eventually leaves. So after being bitten by Dracula, Mina starts cavorting with him and meeting him outside in the garden. He draws her deeper and deeper into his spell. He's very powerful. He's like a pimp of the undead. He can also control other people. He controls the dead Lucy, now turned vampire, and she goes around luring children into her grasp, trying to take her blood, preying on small victims at first. Later the next night, Dracula meets back in into Dr. Seward's office and confronts Van Helsing about what is to come. He says that Mina is now his, that he should back off, go back to your home country where you belong. Then he whips out a crucifix. Dracula goes back from it. He doesn't like it. Definite proof that he is a vampire. Another great scene is when Renfield is shown in his hospital room at night where he's being haunted by Dracula by Dracula's voice, bathed in shadow. He is feeling the urges of the flesh and knows that his fate has been sealed. So now at this point, Mina is under full control of Dracula. She's feeling all those urges. She wants to drink the blood. There's no turning back now for her, it seems. Also, Renfield has escaped from his cell. There's a great line where he talks about rats coming up. He says, rats, rats, thousands of them, millions. It's another great part from Dwight Fry. So both Renfield and Mina take off. Mina following behind Dracula and Renfield going to try to find his master, not knowing that he's being followed by Van Helsing and Jonathan. He unsuspectingly leads them to Dracula's lair. There, Dracula lays down for bed and puts Mina in her new coffin. He has finally made her his Dracula bride. So Van Helsing does the only thing that he can do, take care of Dracula. He takes a wooden stake and drives it right through that bastard's heart. It's awesome and an obvious fitting end to any Dracula movie. The score to this movie is really great, and by score, I really only mean one song. It's from Swan Lake, and Universal used it in a lot of their movies. But now everybody associates it with Dracula, or at least I do. A lot of people believe that this movie opened up on February 14th, 1931. I believe it's said that it opened up a little bit before that or after. Whatever. They try to make it seem like it's a love story, you know? But really, it's like a mesmerizing rape story. I mean, do you really want to be bitten by Dracula? I don't know. Maybe. To wrap it up, Dracula is an absolute classic. Bela Lugosi's portrayal of him is the best and most well-remembered version. His face is unforgettable. Whenever people imitate Dracula, they're doing the Bela Lugosi imitation. I love that he was even buried in the Dracula cape. He lived on forever. 
I also like how Dracula is the most non-reluctant horror icon in the Universal canon. He kind of wants to die, but not really. I think he only really wants to die out of, like, boredom. Like, it's just too much work to stay alive this long. Just end it, man. Just do it. 